Hello and welcome to Furious Driving and today I'll give you a little roundup of the Furious fleet because it is a very foolish fleet of many vehicles, in fact far too many vehicles for anyone of any sense to be trying to maintain single-handed. And uh, I was going to start off with a quick look at the Rover 420 GSI Tourer, one of the rarest cars in the world and a car which I was this close to selling a little while ago because it failed its MOT and it had rust and it had bolts that wouldn't undo and I was just absolutely sick of it but I decided the best thing to do for that car's future was to go and take it for paint. However, I've just called into the body shop to see if it's going and I did say to them I'm not in a rush for it uh, because, well I'm not in a massive rush for it, I've got lots of other cars so it would be lovely to see it done but you know, I'm not in a rush for it and it isn't anywhere in the shop at the minute, it's in storage uh, waiting to, for its turn in the queue. So um, that's fine, that, that suits me fine. I will go and stick it on Sawn. Go and stick it on Sawn, save paying tax on it because it's, it's in the, the storage yard, it's fine. And um, yeah, I've got the money for the paint job in my premium bonds. I've already won 25 quid on, the, on last month's uh, draw, so never know, might win another 25 quid this month. <laughs> the car is paying for itself, kind of. So that's the Rover 420 GSI, it's an astonishingly rare car. Will I keep it when it's done? Do you know what, I'm, I kind of would like to because it's such a rarity, but if it continues to annoy me, I don't know. In the meantime, I know I have got to go and buy, I think, a new windscreen for it, because they're gonna take the, the front glass out of it for painting, and that glass is already cracked. So I need to go and search among the, the Rover nerds with which I frequent my time, and see if anyone's got a front screen for a Rover 400 or 200. I'm sure there'll be one somewhere. I'd like to keep it original Rover, but that's gonna look fabulous in Nightfire Red. Interesting fact about Nightfire Red, any computer or phone you type it into, it's spell checks into Nightmare, so just be aware of that. Uh, but yeah, that's gonna be a fun car when it comes back. Now obviously this bit is filmed out of order, I've got different clothes on, I'm in a different place, and it's raining. But I don't think I explained at the very beginning what the point of this video really is. The thing is, there's lots of new subscribers coming to this channel all the time. And you might not have seen a lot of the back catalogue of the channel. And the Furious Fleet is an enormous part of everything I do on here, this mad collection of cars. Is it a museum? Is it a collection? Am I just buying cars for the sake of the internet? No, not the third one. Um, I'm. Well, basically, I've got a collection of cars which I absolutely love, and I'm collecting cars that I kind of like and I would like to have, and it's sort of a personal museum, it's sort of a saving them for posterity. Sometimes I do sell them, but oftentimes I just hang on to them because, well, I want to make sure they're kept safe. So if you're new to the channel, if you haven't seen a lot of the things, then this is an introduction to what is on the channel. And also, if you've been watching for a while, I mean, I forget what cars I've got quite frequently because they're scattered all over the place. So uh, yeah, it's a little refresher of what the hell have I got and what might be featuring on the channel in the near future. Right, let's get back to poking around some garages. And next, since we've covered the 420 GSI without even seeing it, we might as well cover this one, the other estate on the fleet. This is my 2017 Mercedes C250 AMG line premium plus four Matic. It's a lot of words, and Mercedes are getting silly with the number of words. I need to make the cars wider purely for the badge, although this car did arrive with me debadged. So, anyway, yeah, this, this car continues to be very lovely in a multitude of ways. It's now got just shy by literally that many miles, 120,000 miles on it, which means in the last year and a uh, year and a bit, I've put 25,000 miles on the thing. So uh, yeah, that's been, been putting, the, putting the work in this car. <laughs> I bought it specifically for work. Although I've got a lot of interesting cars, a lot of cars I like, even sort of fairly modern-ish cars like the Freelander and the Rover 75. Anything that's two decades old, there is always a little question mark above its head that is something gonna go pop? The edges are a bit overgrown. Is something going to go pop? Is there some, um, some time and heat cycled plastic that's just going to get let go? And because I don't only do YouTube, I do a day job as well, which means I do a lot of miles for work because I always work on location, I never work in an office. Um, yeah, I'm still going to be getting places on time. The car I bought because of ULEVs, and annoyingly, the first time I drove it into the new expanded ULEV zone, because I changed the number plate on it and it had only been a month for the computer to update, well done you less people, it sent me a fine for non-payment of a car that was completely illegal to drive into. Um, yeah, this car is brilliant, uh, it's absolutely loaded. I wasn't gonna buy a car this loaded, I was only gonna spend the minimum amount to get something from 2015 onwards, but I sat in a 205 chassis Mercedes just to see if I liked it or not, and it was this spec, and uh, I decided I really wanted one. So. <laughs> I've to myself, yeah, for the next million years on 
on a long loan. It'll be mine in a couple of years' time. <laughs> By which point it'll have 400,000 miles and be ruined. But you know, we've got the pretend leather, we've got the real wood, we've got the good computers, we've got the pandemic roof. And basically this car has been fantastic. The only problems I've had with this car, tailgate, it only goes up about three quarters of the way. It's exactly forehead height for me, uh, where it stops. And I've done all the reset things that you, you can do to try and make it work, but none of them work. So, I don't know, I'm going to have to take it down to Stevenson's Mercedes at some point when I get a free morning and just get them to do whatever they need to do to it. Make it happen, make it happy. Anyway, yeah, this car has been fantastic. It's only a basic maintenance, you know, service plan stuff. It's brilliant. It does the miles, it's incredibly comfortable. About two weeks ago, I did a couple of shoots for a magazine. Last minute, real rush job. Um, did a job in, left in the evening, did a job in Guildford, I think it was, in the evening. Drove on to my friend near Bath, stayed on his living room floor for the night. Then he came with me and we drove on to Wales and then dropped him back in Bath and then back home, 550 miles and two photo shoots. And this thing was fabulous, absolutely brilliant. So yeah, this car never gets featured on the channel because I'm not modifying it because I just need it to be comfortable and usable for work and it doesn't cause any problems, touch wood. So um, yeah, it's, it's an unseen car on the Furious fleet. It's the only sensible one I own, I think. Unfortunately, elephant in the room, it's an automatic. Uh, Mercedes quietly discontinued uh, manuals in the C-Class in about 2017 or so, I think, or 2016. So you can get very early 205 chassis C-Classes with a manual, but nothing beyond that, and generally only on very basic spec ones as well. This has got the nine speed, I think it's an automated manual, uh, and it's formatic, so it's four wheel drive as well, so it's a brilliant winter, all season, go anywhere car. But yeah, the automatic is very smooth, it's very clever, yada yada yada, but it's still just, oh jeez, miserable, no fun. Um, don't enjoy driving it very much at all, in terms of you know, entertaining driving. And it still does that thing that all automatics do, you go to pull away from a junction, you floor it, you wait, Eventually it goes, and as you pull away, there's stuff coming, and the new kills you. Anyway, that's this car. It's fabulous. I don't like the gearbox, but I love everything else. But fortunately, it's a very comfortable, very lovely spec car. So this is good. Let's go and look at some less sensible cars. Now this car feels like a bit of an extravagance. It's basically good enough to be a daily car. It's very big. It's worth a lot of money in terms of my car's fleet, my fleet of cars. And it's still for sale at the moment. Um, this is the Rover 75, which, well, everyone loves it, but it is 100% for sale. I don't want to let it go. It's a fabulous car owned by Rover initially, and then one owner for 20 years from 2003 to 2023, uh, very briefly, on the V5 with the guy who he sold it to just to kind of take it off his hands and then me um, and I've given it some love he looked after it really really nicely loads of money spent on this thing over the years and I've done big service changed the uh, coil packs and I've what have I done to it changed the door lock and a few other bits and pieces I've been through this in other videos but yeah this car is absolutely beautiful um, yeah I don't want it to go but it's it's a big modern car and basically I'm paying big modern car prices to have a second daily car that effectively I don't need because I've already got the Mercedes which is a real modern daily car and it's an estate car which I need and so it is Euless though but it's too nice for a daily it's fantastic 61,000 miles incredible anyway that's this car and um, yeah maybe on the next fleet roundup it won't be here anymore which would be very sad but needs must as they say well, here we are in the barn. Um, this is where the extent of the addiction starts to become clear. Uh, this barn I've had for just over a year, year and a half now, I think I must have had it. And it is definitely too small. Um, it's always been kind of a tight access thing because of this staircase. And yeah, basically cars like the Volvo, which are taxed, MOT'd, ready to go, are blocked in by this car and that car and the engine from the Mini. Anyway, this barn is really useful because it does give me a home base to work out of and I've got lots of storage upstairs, so t-shirts and mugs and what have you for going on events and things, all stored up here, which is really useful because, uh, you know, it'd take an entire spare bedroom otherwise. Um, but yeah, it is very, very tight. I need additional car storage at this point. Not good, so let's have a look at what we've got in here. This is a long-term fleet favorite. This is the Rover Coupe, the 220 Tomcat. Uh, which is a lovely car. I actually cleaned it when I was up here the other day because it got a bit dusty sitting in here. Um, 
done quite a lot to this car over the years. It was found as an abandoned in a, in a yard kind of deal. Not a barn find, just a yard find. So out in all weathers, I've put a new uh, spoiler on it because these bubble out from inside and go horrible. I have the roof painted. I've done lots of work under the bonnet as well. Inside, I've recolored the half leather Recaros that I need to go and give them a wash in the center section actually. Put a leather steering wheel on there. Uh, a few other jobs to do to this car, including, um, well, basically, new head gasket. <laughs> it's a wonderful thing. That's so much fun to drive. It's on gas coil over suspension, which I've lowered and then raised up a little bit to make it more comfortable. And we've got the Cosmo, or Cosmos, sorry, BRM style alloys on it, which look fabulous on this car. Uh, it does need a bit of paint, but otherwise, it's a fantastically fun thing to drive. And the dinner is it's not been on the road for a little while this year is because, well, the head gasket is not leaking into the cylinders. It's leaking outside the block onto the exhaust and just leaving oil and smoke everywhere. And it's just not sensible to drive. It's not a great uh, situation to be in. Next to it though, is the Volvo. The Volvo 740 bought for a cheap car challenge back in 2020 for 175 pounds. Can you believe it? These things have suddenly become very cool and very desirable and it's a great thing to own. Um, did a bit of welding when we bought it in 2020. Um, didn't do the cheap car challenge because of world events, as I think we're gonna call them. And uh, yeah, it drove it to Gothenburg, back to the Volvo factory back in springtime. This is a wonderful old bus. Um, there is a large turbo kit on the floor behind it, which if we get some time of the winter, I think that would be something we're gonna look at doing. That'd be quite fun, won't it? Putting a turbocharger on this, Wonderfully comfortable, but dreadfully slow old bus. That'd be a thing to do. Now, moving backwards through the melee and throng of this, we have also got, yeah, okay, this is a slightly stalled project. Uh, I'm gonna need to completely rejig re and rethink everything I was doing on this because it, it, the stuff I was trying to do just didn't work and it needs to work in a different way. This is, this called, this is a Sinclair C5. It's a, um, a pedal powered electric tricycle thing from 1985. Um, only sold, I think, in the UK. Only sold badly in the UK. <laughs> so Clive Sinclair, genius, Elon Musk of his time, but I was gonna say more, more nice personality, but I think he was actually quite a grumpy son and so. Um, but yeah, he's genius as are. Um, but yeah, so that will be, I don't know, something else for the winter to play with. We've got space in here to play with it. Moving backwards, we've got our little Alpha 145. This is an astonishingly rare 1990s hot hatch. These things didn't sell in vast numbers in this country and they have survived in, in even worse numbers in this country because uh, the uh, Italian rust proofing is not really compatible with British road salt. Um, so the fact that this is a clover leaf with factory leather makes it extra nice. It's really unusual color, Azuro Fantasia blue, which is fantastic. Uh, I've never seen one in real life in the same shade. And uh, yeah, loads of welding's been done to this car since I've had it. Uh, the guy I bought it from, an Italian car specialist in the Midlands, had done an awful lot of welding to it, but very badly. And it failed its next MOT horrifically, and we had to cut out the entire sills and the strut tops, which have been really quite nastily bodged. It wasn't really safe at all. Um, so thanks Italian car specialist in the Midlands who did that and then sold me the car for a top whack price but it does have an amazing engine. There are seats about 7,000 um, pounds in this car's engine, um, including grinding the crank and complete rebuild. And to that end, it drives incredibly. The way this engine revs is just astonishing. Uh, I've driven a few other 145s and 6s since owning this, and I used to have one back in the day. And this one is by far and away the, the best one I've come across in terms of the engine performance. Um, so it needs a new clutch though. It's, it's stranded here until we get the new clutch. If we can get that sorted in time, this will go to the NEC with us. I've got a decent sized back end. If you take the, take the seats down, we can fit all the tables and mugs and what have you in there for, for NECing. Uh, it also needs new suspension. I think the, the suspension is a bit tired. It's 130,000 miles in this car. And I think it's the original shocks and springs. So yeah, they need to be changed out. Yeah, go over to see our friends at Gaz who did this one. And they can also do this for a long time. Elstein B6s have been the go-to for the 916 platform alpha, but apparently they're now made to order and it's about a six month to a year lead time. So I think Gaz, who are up in Essex and they build to order as well, but I think they're a bit quicker, might be the way to go. I wasn't gonna go coil overs, but you know, the Gaz one's very adjustable. You can do exactly what you want with them. Yeah, so another couple of nice shades of blue. This is Tahiti blue just here, so dark Tahiti blue. Um, and of course, 
Azuro Fantasia, two, well, basically rival cars. Well, this is a really, really late one. This is 2000, so it's one of the very, very, very last ones built because uh, the 147 came out shortly after this was built. Behind that, we've got our little friend Hippo. Hippo the Freelander. This is a Mark 1 Freelander. Um, Pre-facelift with the BMW 2.0-litre TD4 engine in it and uh, the Jatco Automatic. Now the Jatco is a bit of a weird sluggish thing, but the TD4 is probably the best engine you can stick in one of these cars because, wow, you know, it's got all the power and grunt you need in a small semi-off-roader. I call it semi-off-roader because technically it's an SUV. I don't like the phrase SUV for a car that's actually a proper off-roader. This thing can actually go plug it into the mud really happily. Um, yeah, really, really good car. I've done a fair bit of welding and stuff to this car. The previous owner was the guy who MOT'd it and maintained it for the previous owner before him. So he's done lots of work to it. It's a really good driving car. It does now need brakes and shocks. Um, but yeah, it's kind of at the point where I think I might do a bit of off-roady, upgradey stuff just to make it a little bit more off-roady, upgradey. Because <laughs> um, in terms of maintenance, it's, it's running well at the minute. Although it does still make a grindy noise. We did the prop shaft bearings, which were clearly very nastily gone, and it's better, but I think it might now be either the VCU itself, which does seem to work, but it, there is noise from under there, or it could be the bearings on the rear differential. When you get into double figures of cars, there is always something broken with something. Even if a car is working in most other respects, there will be something wrong with it. For example, Volvo over there, heated seats have broken. Um, it, it's not a thing stopping the car driving, so it's not been done, whereas the clutch and uh, head gasket on these two have stopped them driving so they will be done. Um, Hippo though is great, we do like Hippo a lot. Great thing with this car is it's really big on the inside um, but not that big on the outside. Early generation, I hate the phrase SUV so much but this is a, a small off-roader with car-like capabilities. This is the same footprint as an original Focus. So for the size of a Focus, you've got a lot more space. This is the point of an SUV, but done properly. Modern SUVs, I'm, it's all, yeah, just there. So this is really handy. There are other ones, I would quite like to have like a Discovery 2 or even a Discovery 3, because they're such useful, practical things. Bum the roof on tent, bum the roof tent on one of those, because this is what we primarily use this car for now, is tip runs and camping. And you've got yourself something really cool. There's also a few other things. I quite like having a four-wheel drive of some kind in the fleet for this kind of camping holiday duties. So whether we changed it for, I don't know, a uh, G-Wagon? Yeah, I'm not that rich. <laughs> An old ML, something like that. That would be interesting. It's just the perfect size. It just slots in here and you can park it nose in here in the barn and it's out of the way. If I got a Discovery, apart from the fact it would be broken, it wouldn't fit in here. And that would be an issue having to park it on the street somewhere, especially with the roof tent on, that would be a big security risk because these things are great, but honestly, you know, I've always got half a worry about what if someone turned up and just nicked it and you've lost an awful lot of money's worth of, of gear, with just some tow rag disappearing with it. This is great though. Hippo is enormous fun, lots of time for Hippo. Always like the Mark on Freeland. Anyway, one more car hiding here in the barn is the Morris Mini, which at the time of recording is virtually in a bare shell. I just need to get the wiring loom out, a little bit of the uh, suspension pipe work out, and we are basically ready to go and blast this thing. Um, we're exploring options on how on earth to do that best, whether we DIY it here, whether we send it off for dipping, for blasting, uh, what do you call it, the um, CO2 frozen blasting. I don't know, there's all kinds of options that could be done here, so we need to explore this further. But yes, it does need doing because, well, as you can see, it's it needs to sorting out properly. So 1969, which makes it a Mark II, which is quite a rare, rare um, thing in terms of minis. And it's an automatic, which means a one litre auto. So the auto has got a slightly more powerful engine, which sounds great until you realize it's to cope with the power losses being dropped by the gearbox itself. That's the slot down here. I was initially, my first thought was, well, get rid of the automatic, it's terrible. But that means, first of all, new subframe, and actually possibly a new engine because I think the casting is slightly different for the automatic to the manual. Um, it's actually still connected to the gear shifter because it's all just integrated to the thing. But maybe the next thing I do is this will give this a good clean up. Um, yeah, but then I realised how rare these are. There's something like 14 Mark II automatics on the road, which makes it very, very rare indeed. So we're going to probably put it back as is, unfortunately. But, you know, 
We've got every receipt with the car from when it was new. We've got the delivery notes. We've got the order sheets. We've got so much history. Um, yeah, so it'd be a massive shame to, to spoil it. But there you go. That's the cars that are over here in the barn. We have got quite a few cars at the moment. The thing is, if I was collecting Star Wars figures or wristwatches or model cars, no one would know I've got a big collection because they just shove it in a suitcase or a cupboard or something and it's just gone. The problem with collecting cars is they're quite big. Noticeably big. Yeah, people, people notice that. Oh well, anyway, right, let's head off to the next garage. Right, here we are in the first of our lockup to see the second of our minis. This one, unlike the first one, which is a 1969 Morris, is just purely branded as a mini because it's an R50, but not just any R50, it's a wire edge. This is one of the pre-production minis that was built by BMW for training, for press office work. This particular one was used in Scottle Mini Leeds to be their display car from when they pulled the cover off the, um, the cars at big invited parties. This is one of the very, very earliest minis. It's 202 off the line, or 202 built, I should say. Uh, I got it pre-production. It's a very early build, technically. Hand-built, I think, at this point still. Fantastic little car, enormous fun. Has proved to be incredibly reliable over the few years that I've had it. About seven or eight years I've had this thing now. And um, I only paid 500 pounds for this car. <laughs> I found it in an auto trader or something I thought, and it was up in the fens and then passed from sort of farm worker to farm worker with like 14 owners on the logbooks. Last seen on the channel very recently, we went to the Isle of Wight in the thing. There was the um, West Country Minis event and we drove the thing, me, Mrs. Furious, Furious Junior, um, camping out, well, went for a little sort of weekend away camping with the rest of the mini gang, did a big drive around in the island, went to Osborne House, which is absolutely fantastic. Well, well worth the trip if you're over there, going to South London at all. This is a lovely little car. If there's anything on the chopping block for leaving the fleet, this is not it. Uh, you can see it's got a dint in the roof because these early cars didn't have the bracing in the roof, which is quite weird. Uh, what needs to do to this car, um, job-wise? It needs air conditioning sorting, the radio is not functioning. Beyond that, it's great. I've waxed all that earlier in the year, so I can use it for the winter a little bit. I won't use it too much because obviously it's quite rare. And the headlining, typical of everything 20 years old, is just starting to unpeel. But really, for a car of this age, it's just astonishing condition. Fantastic and so much fun to drive. When these things came out, people complained that they were too big. They weren't easy. Well, they were maxis, and I thought they were hilarious for saying that. Um, but the fact is that of all the minis that have followed, this one really does capture the spirit of, and the style of the original Mini so perfectly well. Even though it is double the size of the original one, it is now a fraction of the size of the current cars. I mean, Mrs. Furious does have a sort of current shape Clubman and this thing is tiny compared to that. This is also way more fun to drive. Right, let's go and look at the two of the next oldest vehicles in the fleet in some other lockups. Well, here we are in another lockup with another car. This is my 1972 Rover P6 2000 SC car, which I've owned for a very, very long time indeed. It's 1992, in fact. This thing is absolutely fabulous, but unfortunately it suffers from squeaky wheel syndrome in so much as that because it's on its own in a garage, which is lovely and safe, but not near enough to be noticeable. Um, it, uh, well, it doesn't get driven, and so as it stopped working, it's kind of forgotten. What's actually wrong with it right now is that the starter motor wiring, it's very dark around this, so I'm not gonna show you much, is actually uh, not very good. So I think we've got a slight problem with the, the positive to the starter being a bit uh, dicky. And also where I changed the engine mounts to non-standard engine mounts, they're not giving enough earth through. So I'm struggling to get an earth for when the car starts. So I've been looking for a place to mount a new earth onto the engine block itself and attach it to the inner wings and I need to rewire the starter motor cable just replace a length of the cable in it which seems to have broken down then we can get things back on the road it is a rather lovely hang on I'll open the door for you long-standing viewers of the channel will remember this car from being on the channel um, it was restored uh, painted about 20 years ago possibly longer than that uh, re-trimmed in about 2009 or 10 and I've not done a huge number of miles since so the interior probably a couple of thousand miles since then so the new leather which you can't see at all in the dark so the interior is absolutely gorgeous red leather 
red carpets combined with the white exterior is a fabulous thing. One of my favorite cars ever, and I absolutely love it. So yeah, I definitely want to get this thing sorted out and back on the road as soon as possible. But this isn't the only Rover P6 because there's also the P6 V8, which people ask about me constantly in the comments because I've been putting the 4.6 in and then it's kind of vanished. And that car originally was a free car. It was someone, it was in his dad's garage. His dad had passed away. It had been parked there for about 15 years. A lot of my cars are free or very cheap cars that have been abandoned and I've just been resurrecting. So the Tomcat, the Mercedes W123, the Mondeo we did last year, uh, Quentin, the Rover 200 convertible. Uh, the list goes on, lots of abandoned rescues. This is like the crazy cat lady of YouTube when it comes to cars. I had it down at one garage and they did a lot of work trying to get the thing started, but they got it to a point, and you saw the video a couple months ago, where they said they got the weird noises and it wasn't getting the oil pressure and stuff, but they got everything running, but it wasn't working. So anyway, I've now moved it. Here's a little clip of the car on the road. Uh, me and Dad trailered it from there to a new, pl new place. Seems to be very, very good indeed. They, s they have diagnosed why it wasn't getting oil pressure. That'll come out in a later video very soon, I hope. Um, but they found a couple of other issues, so it runs nicely, but not perfectly. And we're still working on that, and it'll all will be revealed once we know where we are with that one. But that is a lovely car. That's gonna be an exciting thing to drive. Um, having heard it run now, oh, I'm very much looking forward to getting that on the road. Right, what else have we got lurking around these places? Now back home, we do have a couple more cars to take a quick squint at. I'll start with the most obvious one because if you are a recent newcomer, that's my book, maybe why you're watching this video. This is the Crown Vic, which I'm sure you are fully, fully aware of. Uh, it's currently, well, as you can see, going back together very slowly, but things are happening. Absolutely love this thing. It was based out of a, a town called Beechwood in near Cleveland in Ohio from 2002 until I think early 2022 or to end of 2021. And um, yeah, it served as the as a sergeant's car for most of that time up until about 2015. And then after that point, it was a pool car for the motor pool because the city motor pool dealt with the police, all the government bodies, fire, that kind of stuff. And so it just worked its last couple of years as a, yeah, as, as a loner, but still within the police force. So it's had a long, long service, but only 80,000 miles on it. The condition is really, really good, apart from the fact the sills are completely rotted out. But we're dealing with that. Things are happening. It's on the move. It's nearly, nearly back on the road again. In another six months. <laughs> Behind me, I've got many, too many Rovers. Uh, we've got the Punto, first of all. This is a Punto 75 ELX built in March 1994. This is, as far as we know, the oldest surviving right-hand drive uh, Punto in the UK, possibly the world. Um, there was one that went through Matthewson's auctions and someone uh, flagged it up to me as being an earlier one by a very short time, but I don't know. I've not been able to sort of see any kind of build records on that car, so I don't actually know if that actually is an older car or not. But this is actually not bad condition considering it's had well, a checkered life if you like. It's obviously been enjoyed and loved at first, but uh, kind of neglected in later years and then found and starting to be loved again. It's got a few little knocks and things around it. Um, but it's generally in surprisingly solid condition because these cars do rust like crazy. This is one of the most quickly rusting vehicles on the planet. Uh, generally, it's, it's all good. The, the tow boards, the floors, the sills tend to go on these, but this one hasn't. It has gone up inside there but it's booked in so when the Rover 400 comes back this will follow it over to the uh, the body shop and then take its place in the queue and then that will be the next one to be finished but this is a lovely little car I love the colour on this so much fun to drive back in the 90s Mrs Furious her first sort of new car was a, a couple of year old one of these and it felt so dramatically modern compared to anything else on the market uh, for that kind of money. The, the 90s was when cars just radically changed. And you know, I, I've said it many times, 1990s was peak car. We've got some really quite cool, interesting designs. You've got electronics coming in there. So ABS on a lot of cars, got airbags starting to come in on cars, um, traction control and stability control. So you've got an element of safety stepping up from the 1980s, but you've still got that fantastic mechanical and interactive feel that you just don't get with slightly more modern cars. Stepping slightly forward in time, we've got this little beauty. This is a Rover 200 VI and it might not look anything exciting from the outside, just a British Racing Green three-door R3 Rover 200 bubble with a few scrapes down the side, which we'll get onto at some point, came with them. But this is 
a VI. VIs were the hot, exciting one for quite a while in the Rover 200 range. 1.8 VVC, it's pushing 145, 150 horsepower, so it's a similar kind of power to Peugeot 306 GTI and uh, XSI Alpha 145 with the two liter Golf GTI. It's in that, that whole ballpark of the 1990s hot hatch superb handling lovely comfortable interior there's so much going for this car less than 20 on the road it's a brilliant brilliant little car love it it would be an easy car to sell but i really don't want to sell it which brings me on to this one which is the 75 which we swapped for a fiat idea which we swapped for a volkswagen beetle which we swapped for a ford mondeo and then swapped into this and found i really rather liked it if i didn't already have a sensible estate daily car this would be a prime contender but it's not an estate car, unfortunately, and it's actually surprisingly thirsty for 1.8 turbo. But this is absolutely beautiful. It's a Club SE from memory, um, which means it's sort of mid-range cloth seats, slightly on the cusp of losing a lot of the good stuff from Project Drive, but we have put the proper wood back in it, proper nice wood steering wheel, got the cloth seats. The car is in fabulous condition, but it is unfortunately for sale because it needs to go, however, it's on Car and Classic. Hopefully someone who is desperate to love one of these things will come and find it. Now last, but by no means least, despite the fact it is being used entirely as a table, including for some of its own parts, it has to be said, is this rather fabulous Mercedes W123. This is a 1983 230E. And the reason it's being used as a table is because it doesn't normally live in this garage. It was living under a cover where the Punto is, but when the uh, Rover V8 vacated the garage to go and have engine work done, this seemed like a prime contender to take that space. Unfortunately, it's so big, it barely, barely fits. I've just been using the airline and I can't get back alongside it to coil it up. It's a, actually a problem <laughs> how big it is in this garage space. I can't move past it quite often, so stuff just gets piled on top of it. Um, but this is a car which um, hasn't been on the channel for a few months because it's stuck in here. Um, I found it in a barn, literally it was a genuine barn find. And over, well, following months into years, I uh, rebuilt the fuel line, rebuilt the Bosch cage electronic, got the thing started. We've been doing bodywork down the front because the front corner was a bit rotten. Then we found this rear corner was rotten, so put a new inner arch in there. Um, we've got a new outer arch to pop on there. Well, I can get it out of the garage because currently there's a Crown Victoria in the way. Um, needs brakes and the arch, and then basically, although it'll be scruffy, that is potentially okay to MOT, which is stunning. And I really cannot wait to get this thing on the road. Whether I then keep it or decide it's a bit too slow and boring, I don't know. This is one of the ultimate cars. With this, the Volvo and the Crown Vic, I've basically got three cars which will do half a million miles each. I mean, in theory, I could just drive these three cars for the rest of my life because I will never wear out. <laughs> In my opinion, it's an exciting, interesting car. It's 230E, it's the uh, evolution of the 230, because it got the fuel injection, which was a big step up on the previous generations of carbureted cars, which made them faster, more powerful, better economy, a big step up in every respect. So this is very, very cool indeed. However, it is stuck. Oh, it needs a new front wing. I forgot I need to come buy a new front wing for it. That is the entire collection. How many cars is that? 14 cars, 15 including the, uh, the Sinclair C5, 16 if you include my wife's car which is obviously out and about at the moment. Yeah that's, that's enough vehicles to be going on with. But yeah this is the state of the Furious fleet. Um, yeah, lots of silliness really. Um, not everything gets featured all the time because obviously you concentrate on the bigger jobs and sometimes things just need to get done. So thank you for watching, I hope you've enjoyed this little look around and explore how many cars there actually are lurking around here and what's happened to my sanity, I don't know. Anything, anyway, as always, please hit like and subscribe so you can follow the adventures of these vehicles and see what sticks around, what goes away, what gets fixed, and maybe what doesn't. And lots and lots to come. Hopefully, you'll enjoy it all. See you later. Goodbye.